The scripture reading this morning is from John 1, verse 43 through 51. Hear the word of the Lord. The next, the next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered him, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I, was, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This is the word of the Lord. I was reading in Deuteronomy this past week that when the people of Israel came to the place where the Lord would cause his name to dwell, and they brought their sacrifices, and they brought their offerings and their tithes unto the Lord in that place, the Lord says three times to them, and you shall rejoice in the presence of the Lord your God. And it really convicted me to uh, think of the fulfillment of what is being pictured in the Old Covenant worship when the people would come to the temple, that the Lord required them to rejoice in his presence. It convicted me that when I come here into the presence of God and I worship among the temple of the Lord, which is what you are, how often do I come rejoicing in the Lord and how often do I come rejoicing in what he's done for me? I, I confess that Many times I'm, I struggle with depression and despair and think that, man, things are just never going to get any better. But we know that that's not true. There's always reason to rejoice in what God has done for us in Christ. In the midst of a world of pain, it is a subject for praise in every place. A song on earth, an anthem in heaven, it's praise and virtue knowing no end. That is in reference to the gospel. And uh, so let's rejoice together as we come to the presence of the Lord and hear his word and pray to him now together. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come before you confessing how shallow our love and how shallow our joy in you really is. Uh, even at our greatest moments of joy and rejoicing in you, Lord, it's it's but a drop in a bucket of what you deserve. Not even that. It's dust on the scales. The whole combina the, the, the combined weight of joy that your people have is but dust on the scales compared to what you deserve. So Lord, I pray that this morning you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. That you would remind us of all that is ours in Christ. Lord, that you would help us come and see the glory of the Lord Jesus. That we would see heaven open and angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And Lord, that we would see greater things than what you, by your grace, have caused us to see thus far. Yes. Lord, we're reminded of those who can't and are not among us, or many are absent of the highnesses, sick children, and uh, Phyllis Anderson, and uh, having broken her wrist and injured her knee, or the uh, Jim and Robin Mathewitz who are away, um, or the Smiths, at least one of them who is not here, or well, two of them, uh, Lizzie and Matthew. Um, and, um, and others, Lord, that are not here among us. Um, we pray that that would be no hindrance to their joy in you. Yes. 
that that would be uh, no opportunity there for the devil to take advantage of their being separated from the body for various reasons. Um, Father, we pray that you would uh, restore them to health, that you would take care of them in their time of need, uh, that you would minister to them in their pain, that you would be enough for them, Lord, and that you would show that your grace is sufficient in every moment of our weakness. And uh, God, that you would restore them to the body, and that we would know more fully what it means to have our hearts knit together in love under the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for that blessing even today among us who are gathered here, and we ask that you would be with us for Jesus' sake, that you would work in and among us for the glory of your name and for our eternal good under our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, we've been uh, walking through this closing section of John chapter 1 for longer than I anticipated, probably not longer than you anticipated, but um, I thought that we would get through this maybe in one message, but uh, the Lord has had us break this section down and really look at these different disciples who are being described here and really describing the process of how they were converted to Jesus Christ and how they became his disciples. Now, as I've said before, I believe that really this section at the end of John chapter 1 lays before us the invitation of the gospel. It's the introduction to the gospel of John, the, entire chapter, the entirety of chapter 1. And this closing section of chapter 1 sets before us the invitation of the entire gospel of John. The, the glory of the only begotten Son of God has been revealed. The true light of God has broken into our darkness and has come to save us from our darkness. And now, all that is left is for everyone to come and obey the call of God, to come and see what God has done for us in Christ Jesus, to come and see His glory. And we have this gospel account, the gospel of John, as a means of helping us do that. That's why John has written this gospel, so that we would be able to come and see the glory of Christ that they themselves, that the apostles had seen during his earthly ministry. Now today we're going to finish this introduction by looking at how the fifth disciple, Nathaniel, came to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And uh, I want to start maybe by taking a step back, even though we're going to be considering Nathaniel. I want to look at a few things from Philip and the calling of Philip. And I want to start by reminding us of some of what we briefly saw last week in John chapter 1, verse 43. So let's start there. This verse opens up saying that it is the next day, on the next day. That's now day four of this one-week period in the Gospel of John that runs from chapter 1, verse 19, to chapter 2, verse 11. So we're on day four of that week. Jesus is beginning to make his way from the lands of Judea, uh, east of Jerusalem particularly, up to the region of Galilee. And in John, we're going to see the account of Jesus' ministry really bouncing back and forth between Galilee and Jerusalem quite often. So that's going to be kind of like signpost to significant markers in his ministry, significant times. But before Jesus went to Galilee, he first found Philip and commanded him, follow me. And that, in that command, we find really the substance of what all true discipleship is. All true discipleship is following Jesus. Now, there are two things I want to point out from this before we move on. And uh, come with me. First of all, this account with Philip presents an interesting picture of Christ here. What we find with Jesus is that he was not just passively waiting in the shadows for people to make the decision to come follow him. He wasn't just passively receiving whoever would, would choose to come after him. Here we find Jesus as being the one who is in control of who comes after him. Who follows him. He's the instigator. He's the pursuer. He is the one taking the initiative in calling his disciples. And that's going to become a, a really important theme as we move through this gospel, especially when we get to chapter 6. And Jesus emphasizes his sovereignty 
in determining who will and will not be his follower. However, at the same time, this verse also paints an interesting picture of what is required for us to be Christ's disciple. So we not only see this picture of Christ as being the active agent in pursuing disciples, but we also find what is expected of people in order to become a disciple. This is something that God's been reminding me of a lot in my personal time in his word. It's that Jesus is, just as Jesus is not passive in creating disciples, those who would be his disciples cannot be passive either. You follow me there? One of you did. That was Hoochie. That's his characteristic. Mmm. Mmm. That's good, brother. That's good. I like that. If you can't say amen, you might as well say mmm. I like it. So we find this, this other side of that picture being painted as to what's required of people to become a disciple of Christ. Jesus is not passive in creating disciples, but those who would be his disciples cannot be passive either. Jesus lays down before Philip a command. It's a call to action. Basically, it is a call for Philip to conscientiously and determinately make the decision to follow after Jesus. Now, here's the really significant part of that, and it's going to be a wow factor for you. Maybe, maybe there's some wow factor here. Philip actually had to make the decision to follow Jesus in order to get up and follow Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Paradigm shift. No, it's actually common sense, right? If you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, you actually have to make the decision to follow him. It's that simple. We don't sit around and wait for Jesus to make that decision for us. When the call of the gospel comes upon us, the demand of the gospel comes upon us, and that demand is to get up from wherever we are and actually become a follower of Jesus. I've met too many people who have been wrongly influenced or have a wrong understanding of Reformed theology or Calvinistic theology who think that because they don't want to do something, they can't do something, and they've got to wait for Jesus to make them to want to do it before they can actually get up and do it. That's ridiculous, and that flies in the face of all the commands that we have in Scripture. Jesus commands us to get up and follow him. The only issue is, are you willing to do that? Will you get up? Will you follow after Jesus? Will you become his disciple? Following Jesus is not passive. It's not something that just happens when we let go and let God do it. Right? I hate that phrase. Let go and let God. There's a right context for it. I don't want to utterly demean it. But, man, that is just, I, it grates on my soul to hear people say that. Let go and let God. No, trust God and get going. That's really the biblical call. Following Jesus is not passive. To follow him means day to day, moment by moment, making the decision to trust in Jesus as our teacher and our leader. It is day by day and moment by moment making the decision to walk as he walked, to follow his example, to be conformed to his image, to actively obey his commands and to humbly learn from him. And to be willing to place his yoke upon our shoulders and let him drive us wherever he wants us to go. If you and I would be Christ's disciples, then we must prepare ourselves to do this every single day. Understanding that today, as of today, if I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, then I am called to follow him. I'm called to follow him in every situation. I'm called to follow him in every circumstance that arises, in every relationship, in every interaction that comes about. I am called to be a disciple in that moment and in that situation. I am called to follow Jesus practically through whatever that situation may require or may be. I must practically follow Jesus through it. I must walk like he walked. I must live as he lived. I must do what he did so that my life becomes nothing more and nothing less than an expression of a life consecrated to Jesus Christ. That is discipleship. And that's how we obey Christ's command to follow him 
And this is the charge Jesus laid down for Philip. Follow me. It's the condition of being his disciple. It's the same for you and me. So Philip obeys this command. Philip follows after Jesus. And as soon as he became convinced that Jesus truly was the Christ, in John chapter 1, verse 45, we find that he went to find another man named Nathaniel. Now I want to notice four things about this interaction between Philip and Nathaniel. Number one, notice what Philip says to Nathaniel. Philip came to Nathaniel declaring, we have found him. We have found him. It's a parallel to what Andrew's words to Simon Peter were when he said, we have found the Messiah. Well, here, Philip is doing the same thing, declaring that we have found him. The fourth century preacher Chrysostom, anybody heard of him? A few of you have. Golden Mouth, they called him. Just because his preaching was so anointed by the Lord. Chrysostom said on this verse, he said, The expression, we have found, belongs always to those who are in some way seeking. In other words, to say that we have found him means first that they were seeking him. And as God has promised in his word, everyone who seeks will find the Lord. Now, this is being said to the unbeliever. This is being said to the believer as well. You and I both know that as believers, we go through lull periods in our walk with Christ where we feel that we we can't find him. We don't see him. We don't know him as we ought to know him. We don't taste his nearness the way or experience his nearness the way we used to, maybe at one point or period. Well, to both unbeliever and believer in this room, 2 Chronicles 15, 2 promises us that if we will seek him, God will let us find him. Deuteronomy 4, 29, the same promise to Israel applies to you and me. We will seek the Lord our God and we will find him if we seek for him with all our heart and all our soul. Luke eleven ten, 10, Jesus promises for everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, what? Finds. If you knock on that door, it will be open. That's God's promise to us. And here, Philip says to Nathaniel, we have found him. We've been seeking for him, and God has let us find him. Now, just briefly, brief application here. I don't have time to develop it very much, but just an important rule to keep in mind. That if you and I cannot also say with the same confidence and conviction, we have found him, then the answer to our problem is pretty simple. We are not truly seeking him. And that's it. If we're struggling to find the Lord, and yet he has promised that when you seek me, I will let you find me, then the answer to our problem is very simple and straightforward, even if it's not what we want to hear. We're not seeking him the way he has called us to seek him. That's one thing to notice about Philip's interaction with Nathaniel. He says, we have found him found the one that they were seeking. Notice, secondly, how Philip describes the one whom they had found. He says in John 1.45, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. This, This is a remarkably rich statement. It's one that captures the heart of how the Old Testament and New Testament relate to one another. How do you blend these two together? How are they related to each other? How are we to read the Old Testament and the New Testament as one book that's been given to us by God? Well, the answer is here in this statement. The entire Old Testament, according to Philip's words here, is about one person. And we have found him, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now that tells us something pretty remarkable that we need to remember about the Old Testament. The entire Old Testament is not primarily about a strip of land at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea. It's not what the Old Testament is about. The Old Testament is not primarily about the kingdom of God established through the nation of Israel in types and shadows. 
The Old Testament is not merely about laws and genealogies and sacrifices and temple worship. The entire Old Testament is about him. It's about Jesus. It's not about Israel. Do you understand that? The Old Testament is primarily about Jesus Christ. Everything in the Old Testament, no matter what it is, was designed by God to point us forward to Jesus and to prepare the people of Israel for Jesus' arrival. And we're going to see this more as we walk through the Gospel of John, but Jesus says this very clearly in John 5.39. He says, You search the Scriptures because in them you think you have life, but you fail to see that it is these that bear witness of me. The next verse, and you refuse to come to me. Jesus said that the entire Old Testament is about him. You see the same thing in Luke 24, 44 through 46. This is the truth that drove Augustine so famously to say that the New Testament is in the old concealed and the old is in the new revealed. So the New Testament is in the Old Testament, but it's concealed. It's hidden in mystery. It's clothed in mystery, but it's there. And when you come to the New Testament, all of a sudden you find the Old Testament unveiled before you. You find the Old Testament revealed. And you see exactly what its message always was. Salvation from God through His Son, who came to be the Savior of the world. I love how J.C. Ryle put this. I've got a few quotes from Ryle in his commentaries today. Just sometimes you read a writer and there's one statement after another after another that just pops out at you. So I wanted to share this with you guys. I like how J.C. Ryle put this. He wrote, Christ is the sum and substance of the Old Testament. To him, the earliest promises pointed in the days of Adam and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. To him, every sacrifice pointed in the ceremonial worship appointed at Mount Sinai. Of him, every high priest was a type, and every part of the tabernacle was a shadow, and every judge and deliverer of Israel was a figure. Isn't that rich? He was the prophet, like unto Moses, whom the Lord God promised to send. He is the king of the house of David, who came to be David's Lord, as well as his son. He was the son of the virgin and the lamb, foretold by Isaiah. He's the righteous branch mentioned by Jeremiah. He's the true shepherd foreseen by Ezekiel. He's the messenger of the covenant promised by Malachi. He is the Messiah who, according to Daniel, was to be cut off, though not for himself. The further we read in the volume of the Old Testament, Ryle writes, the clearer do we find the testimony about Christ. Those of you who have read enough in the Word, you know exactly what he's talking about. You read back through the Old Testament, you read through the New, then you come back to it, and all of a sudden things pop out at you, make sense to you, point to Christ in ways that you never saw it before. It's a remarkable statement by Philip because it reveals that even at this time, as we're going to see in the Gospel, even at this time, though there was much confusion among the people about who the Christ would be and what He would be like, there was still a remnant of true believers in whom the Holy Spirit was working and giving them illumination from the Old Testament Scriptures. I wonder how much we ourselves see of Jesus when we read the Old Testament. To quote Ryle again, he says, Do we find it hard to see Christ in the Old Testament? Let us be sure that the fault is all our own. It is our spiritual vision which is to blame and not the book. It's the eyes of our understanding that need to be enlightened. The veil has yet to be taken away. Let us pray for a more humble, childlike, and teachable spirit. And let us take up Moses and the prophets again. Christ is there though our eyes may not yet have seen him. Here's the point in that. Until you understand that the entire Old Testament, until you understand the entire Old Testament in reference to Jesus of Nazareth, you do not yet understand the Old Testament. And until you see Jesus as the one to whom God is pointing and has been pointing for all the millennia of the Old Testament period, then you do not truly see Jesus for who he is. 
Philip says to Nathanael, we have found the one who fulfills what Moses and the prophets wrote about. We found him, and he is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. All right, number three. Notice the third thing here in this interaction between Philip and Nathanael. Notice Nathanael's response. John 1.46, Philip says, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. To which Nathanael responds, saying, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, it's interesting to me that of all that Philip said to Nathanael right there, the one piece that stood out to him was the claim that the Messiah was Jesus and that Jesus was from Nazareth. Nazareth was a a small and insignificant town of that day. Archaeologists estimate that there were probably around 200 to 500 people who were living in Nazareth when Jesus spoke those words, or when uh, Nathanael spoke those words to Philip. Not a very great or impressive city, not one that was fit for the Messiah King. And on top of that, you notice that Nathanael says um, in this uh, verse, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Indicating that Nazareth was not necessarily seen to be a bastion of holiness or godliness. It wasn't necessarily a place where godly people were known to come from anyway. And more so, after Philip says the one Moses and the prophets wrote about is Jesus of Nazareth, logically, what follows is the realization that neither Moses nor the prophets said that the Messiah was going to come from Nazareth. So, you know, Micah 5.2, it says that he would be born in Bethlehem. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6, says that he was going to reign in Zion, which at that time, the Old Testament type and shadow of Zion was the city of Jerusalem. And so whether due to prejudice or cynicism or whatever else was behind this, all of this led Nathaniel to have doubts about this claim that Jesus was actually the Messiah. Now, I want you to notice, fourthly, how Philip responds to Nathaniel's doubt. John 1.46, after Nathanael says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip responds to him by saying, come and see. Come and see. That's so simple. And that's so amazing to see what Philip is doing here with Nathanael. Notice what Philip is not doing here. Philip does not try to reason with Nathanael. You see that? He doesn't try to answer all of Nathaniel's doubts. He doesn't labor to convince Nathaniel with evidences and facts that would say that Jesus truly is the Messiah, even though he is from Nazareth. He simply says, well, if you really want to know whether this Jesus is the one that we've been waiting for, then you will have to come and see for yourself. This is the best possible answer that any of us can give to a skeptic that we're witnessing to. No amount of reasoning is ever going to be enough to bring someone to faith in Jesus Christ. Do you you believe that? Have you experienced that enough in witnessing to unbelievers that you can lay down before them the clearest and most articulate and well-reasoned gospel presentation possible and they still walk away with unbelieving hearts? You can give them every bit of 10,000 evidences that demand a verdict and they don't come away converted to Christ. Why is that? It's because the fallen human heart that is in a natural state of enmity against God, will only come up with another excuse not to believe once the first excuse has been answered. None of us can argue someone into the kingdom of heaven. As Jesus himself said to skeptics in John chapter 7, verse 17, he said, if anyone is willing to do God's will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. Now here, as I said, Jesus is speaking to skeptics. And he's saying, listen, if you really want to know whether what I'm saying is true, if you really want to know whether I am the one I claim to be, then your will is going to have to be to do the will of the one who sent me. And if your will is to do the will of the one who sent me, then you will know that I truly have come from him. In other words, someone who is unwilling to come to Jesus and see him for themselves will never come to see the truth about him. 
That's one thing we see from Philip's response. But there's also something else I want to point out about Philip's response and what it shows us. It shows us the confidence that Philip had in Christ to do the convincing. Let me rephrase that. It shows us that Philip was absolutely confident that Christ could do the convincing himself for Nathaniel. Philip didn't feel the need to defend Jesus to Nathaniel or to answer all of his questions. He was absolutely confident that Jesus could do that just fine on his own. All that Philip needed to do was invite Nathaniel to come and see the truth in Jesus. Now, my application there is that this is the limit of our evangelism. We cannot convince people to be saved, even with the greatest or most sound reasoning. We cannot convince people about the truth of Christ if they are still unwilling and unready to be convinced. All that we can do is, like Philip, come to them out of the fullness of our own relationship with Christ and out of our own personal knowledge of him, and then urge and invite them to come to Jesus and see the truth for themselves. Now, what does that require? Now, let me, let me clarify something here. I'm not saying that we don't go forth preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost until they are ready to be preached to. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, is that there's nothing that we, there is a limit to what we can do in bringing someone to Jesus Christ. We can only preach the truth of the gospel, and we can only preach that truth with power and effectiveness to the degree that we feel the power and the effectiveness of the gospel in our own lives. Philip comes to Nathanael saying, we have found the Messiah. Nathanael doubts, and he says, well, you got to come see for yourself then. That's the same way with us. When we are witnessing to the lost out in the world among us, There's nothing that we can do to make them become believers. What we can do, though, is keep our walk with Christ rich, keep it full of life and vigor in following after Christ so that when we go out in the world and preach the truth about Jesus, we actually have something to say to them. We have the ability with conviction to declare to them, I have found the truth. I have found the Messiah. And you need to come with me back to him so that you can see it for yourself. J.C. Ryle again, he wrote, far a few are ever moved by reasoning and argument. And he's talking about in coming to Christ. Few are ever moved by reasoning and argument. Still fewer are frightened into repentance. The man who does most good to souls is often the simple believer who says to his friend, I have found a savior. Come and see him. So those are four things I wanted to pick up from this interaction between Philip and Nathaniel that I think are instructive for us. We see in John 1.47 that though Nathaniel had some doubts, he had a heart to do God's will, and therefore he was willing to come and to listen and to investigate the matter for himself. So by the end of Philip's interaction with Nathaniel, we find him bringing Nathaniel to Jesus. Now, let's flip to notice... Jesus' interactions with Nathanael. We've been paying attention to Philip's interactions with Nathanael. Now let's notice Jesus' interactions with Nathanael. In John 1.47, as soon as Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, he said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now that's an amazing statement in light of the fact that Nathanael was still doubting whether the testimony he had heard about Jesus was true. Nathanael came to Jesus with questions. Nathanael came to Jesus with doubts. So how could Jesus give such a high praise to someone like Nathanael who was filled with doubt about who Jesus really was? Well, I think the answer is found in paying attention to how Jesus describes Nathanael. He describes him in two ways. In John 147, he calls him, first of all, a true Israelite, an Israelite indeed. And then secondly, describes him as one in whom there is no deceit. Now, this is a play on ideas that Jesus is bringing up here. Both of these descriptions are drawn from Jacob in the Old Testament, if you might recall that. 
You remember that Jacob, Isaac's son, well, let me ask it this way. Do you remember what Jacob, the name Jacob, means? What does it mean? Kind of. It means supplanter. Someone who supplants. Remember whenever he came out, he was grabbing on to Esau's foot? Right? He was named Jacob, one who supplants. Now, the record of Jacob's life in Genesis shows that he lived up to his name as a supplanter. And he accomplished that end of being a supplanter by using deceit. So he deceived his brother with the stew. He deceived his father for the blessing of the inheritance. He deceived Laban, his father-in-law, when he snuck off secretly with his family. You might even say he deceived his father-in-law in his dealings with the sheep. Well, one night in the Old Testament, Jacob was given a new name. Jacob, the supplanter, the deceiver, was given a new name by God when God had appeared to him in the form of a man, and Jacob wrestled with him all night. You remember the account? While Jacob was prevailing and still refusing to let this man go, who was an appearance of God as a man, he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. In Genesis 32, verses 27 through 28, we read that in response to that, God blessed the man by changing his name. He asked him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And God said to him, your name shall no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. That's what the name Israel means. It means he who strives with God. Now, Jacob wasn't perfect. His relationship with God was marked with all kinds of sin. But here, there's one characteristic that God identifies about Jacob and, and blesses him in identifying him this way. He says, you shall be called Israel, one who has striven with God and prevailed. Now, back to John 147, when Jesus saw Nathanael, that is exactly what he saw in him. He did not primarily see his doubts, even though his doubts were there, but he saw him as one who genuinely strives with God. Nathaniel's questions, in other words, did not arise from an evil and unbelieving heart, but from a heart that was genuinely wrestling with God in order to find the answers. He may have had doubts, but at least he was being honest with those doubts. You know, just briefly, in application... Jesus can handle our questions, and he can even handle our lingering doubts. You know, the truth can handle being questioned. But the one thing that Jesus will never receive is anyone who will not approach him with an honest heart. And Nathaniel came to him with an honest heart, seeking to find the truth. And Jesus said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no guile. Now notice Nathaniel's response, John 1, He asks, how do you know me? We've never met before. Who told you about me? Well, Jesus answered saying, no one had to tell me about who you were, Nathaniel. Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now this one statement is so profound for Nathaniel that by itself it caused him to confess in John 1.49 that Jesus is not only his rabbi, his teacher now, but he also confessed that you are the Son of God, the King of Israel. The commentators have speculated about why Jesus, what Jesus said caused Nathaniel to respond like this. But I think it's probably because Jesus was manifesting evidence that proved to Nathaniel who he truly was exercising his divine omniscience and speaking to Nathaniel in ways that would prove who he really was. If you just imagine with me, it may be that Nathaniel was under a fig tree reading scripture and praying. That was a very common Jewish practice in this day. Based on certain passages from the Old Testament, they would find a vine or a fig tree and they would go and meditate and pray and read the scriptures in their personal devotion, I guess, we, as we would call it. Maybe Nathaniel was under a fig tree and maybe he just happened to be reading the account of Jacob wrestling with God in Genesis. And maybe in light of that, in response to that, maybe Nathaniel was praying, oh God, please don't let me be a Jacob. 
Don't let me be a supplanter, a deceiver. Let me be a true Israelite. Let me be one who lives and wrestles with you in all honesty and integrity. Let me rightly bear the name Israel. Let me see Jacob's ladder reaching to heaven, reaching to glory. Open up heaven to me, O God. We have no idea if that's actually what happened, but it's not hard to envision that taking place, especially in light of how Jesus draws upon the account of Jacob in his interactions with Nathanael. Maybe that is what Nathanael was doing when he was all alone under the fig tree before Philip called him. Now imagine the impact of Jesus using that language from Genesis in the account of Jacob and drawing upon it in his interactions with Nathanael. Imagine the impact that would have had to convince him that he was the God that Nathanael was reading about and he was the God that Nathanael was praying to. Regardless of what exactly had happened, there was enough proof in these 14 words to bring Nathanael to true and saving faith. Now lastly, notice the promise that Jesus makes to Nathanael in John 1.50. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. That is the promise. He will see greater things than these. Now that's fascinating to me. Because Jesus just revealed an element of his glory to Nathanael, something that for Nathanael was so monumental that it ushered him into faith. And yet Jesus here almost treats what had happened as something small and insignificant compared to what Nathanael would come to see. It's as if Jesus said to him, you believe because I said that you're under a fig tree? Oh, Nathanael, you are going to see far greater things than that. Truly, truly, I am telling you, Nathanael, you are going to see heaven itself opened up and you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now, regardless of what exactly it means to have angels going up and down on the Son of Man, I I think if we spent time focusing on that, we miss the point that Jesus is making. The parallel here is obvious. Jesus is picking up on Jacob's vision in Genesis 28, 12, when Jacob had dreamed about heaven itself opening up and a ladder um, being stretched from earth to heaven and angels going up and coming down on that ladder. Or you might think of it as like a staircase. When Jacob woke up, he declared, surely God is in this place, and I did not know it. And he called that place Bethel, meaning the house of God, and described it as the gate to heaven. Now Jesus points back to this vision and tells Nathanael, as a true Israelite, you are going to see the fulfillment of that vision in me. What Jacob saw as a gate, as an entryway, as an access point between heaven and earth, now finds its fulfillment in the man standing before you, Nathaniel. And as Nathaniel followed Jesus and continued to behold him and learn from him and continued to deal honestly with Jesus from his heart, he would come to see not only special things about Jesus... He would not only come to understand Jesus as a prophet, but he would come to see Jesus as the very gateway to heaven itself and see the glory of the God of heaven manifesting in him. And you know from the rest of the account, that's exactly what happened. In John chapter 2, with changing water into wine, the disciples beheld his glory and they believed in him. John chapter 9, when Jesus healed the man that was blind, they beheld his glory and believed in him. John 11, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they beheld his glory and they believed in him. John 20, when they beheld Jesus Christ himself risen from the dead, they believed in him. Each new experience that they had in following Jesus only served to expand their sense of Christ's glory and as a result increased their faith in Him. Did you follow me there? Yes, no. The promise from Jesus is as Nathaniel continued to follow after Jesus, his experience and his understanding and his realization about the glory of God revealed in Christ would only grow greater. And that serves as a model and a pattern for the true and faithful Christian life. See, verse 50 of John chapter 1 really serves as a pattern For every Christian who in faith follows Christ. 
Isn't this what it is like being and becoming a Christian? Minding our own business, going our own way, and all of a sudden, the Lord uses something that grabs our attention. Most often, it's something very small. It's something that later on in years seems almost insignificant, but it had a great impact and great power whenever it came upon us at first. And then the more we follow after Christ in faith and the more we seek Him in the truth, the more clarity we get about who He really is and about the glory of God that's been revealed in Him and about the reality that we can put our faith and trust in this Jesus to be our utter and complete Savior. Our confidence to do that grows as we mature and continue following Jesus as His disciple throughout life. Just as, just as happened to Nathaniel and the other disciples. The longer that we walk with Christ, the more we follow him, not, not perfectly, but sincerely. The more we do that, the greater our perspective of his glory will expand and the stronger our faith in Christ will become. This is the normal Christian life. This is the normal Christian experience. You remember 2 Corinthians 3.18. It's the Christian life is going from one degree of glory to another as we behold as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So we are constantly keeping our eyes upon Jesus. We are constantly following after Jesus through every circumstance in every situation that we face. We are following after Him as His disciple, keeping our eyes fixed upon Him. And as we do that, we are translated from one degree of glory to another in our relationship with Him. So, therefore... If we are left with an experience that says, man, my time with Christ early on was of far greater glory than my time with Christ now, then something is wrong. Just as Jesus promised to Nathaniel, so the promise remains for us. We will see greater things than these as we follow him. Now, we see what those specific things were for Nathaniel in the Gospel of John. It's not going to be the same for us, but the reality, the substance of what is happening will be the same. Our perception of Jesus will only grow in greater and greater degrees until that day when we are caught up to be with him in glory and we finally see him face to face. The Christian life is one of increasing perception and greater realization and experience of Jesus Christ and his glory. And that only comes as we continue to come to Jesus and continue to strive to see him. I was talking with a brother the other night. We were coming back from uh, Valley Fair. First time I've ever been there. It is definitely Vanity Fair. Um, But there are some really fun rides. We had, we had a number of things happen on that trip. And uh, one, of them, one of them greatly bothered me. There was a guy who apparently had stolen keys from two ladies. And my friend and I were walking in line to get on the ride. And this guy kind of bumped through us and, and went along. I didn't think anything of it. And then all of a sudden, three girls come running around the corner, ladies, in their young 20s, low 20s. One of them said, hey, can you guys help us? That guy just stole her keys, right? And so here's protector in me, rises up. I'm like, yeah, I'm on it. So I run this guy down. I chase him down. We, uh, my friend and I, we, we got around him and we started saying, hey, man, give her back her keys. Did you steal her keys? He's like, what? I didn't do anything. I don't know what you're talking about. It's like, well, these ladies say that you stole their keys. Give them back. And as it began to progress, I was called a racist and all kinds of stuff because I was trying to get him to give the car keys back to this lady. I'll spare you all the, all the details. But what I saw come out of me in that interaction with this guy really troubled me. At one point in my conversation with him, he turned to his side and kind of bowed up like he was getting ready to hit me. And rather than trying to be a peacemaker, 
rather than keeping my eyes on Jesus and following Jesus in that moment, I squared right up against him and stepped in and said, take your best shot. How ridiculous. Thankfully, my friend had more sense than that. And after it was all settled and done, my friend went up to him and began to check on him to make sure that this guy was okay. And that led to an opportunity where I was able to share some of the gospel with him and exhort him to run to Christ. But what troubled me was that in that moment, why did I not respond in a more Christ-like manner? Why was my gut reaction one of violence rather than one of peace? This really serves as a confession to all of you guys, right? But it's an illustration of what happens when we get distracted from the gospel. Following after Jesus Christ means that in situations like that, whether they're that extreme or not, that we are always having our eyes fixed upon the Lord Jesus. And we are always walking through the situation we're facing in a manner that's holding on to his hand. It's, it's asking the Lord, Lord, how would you have me respond to this? How would you have me speak with this person? How would you have me handle what just happened? If we're not diligent and vigilant to keep our eyes upon the Lord and to be diligently seeking after Him, we're not going to be empowered to respond rightly when stuff hits the fan and pressure comes upon us. And so often we think about, hear about Christians being persecuted and we ask ourselves, man, what would I do in that moment? How would I handle my daughter being decapitated? How would I handle my family being murdered in front of me? How, how would I respond to something like that? You know, and we project and we try to work it out in our minds of like, well, when that happens or if that happens, this is how I'm going to plan to respond. <laughs> Guys, that doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. The only way we can be prepared to respond to whatever is coming our way in the future is if right now in this moment we are disciplining ourselves to, to maintain a close and tight and ever increasingly tight relationship with the Lord Jesus. It's only as we are being built up and rooted in Him that we're going to be prepared to face whatever comes our way. So to live the Christian life, we have to be increasing in our understanding, in our knowledge, in our perception of Jesus Christ and his glory. And the only way that happens is if we continue to pursue him. We continue coming and seeing him. Now, closing application here. Let me end on this. Just kind of coming back away from Nathaniel and looking at the whole section of what we've, what we've considered these five disciples who've come to faith in Christ. What we see here really are different accounts of how Jesus called different people to be his disciples. And we not only see the different ways that Jesus called them to faith, but we also see the different experiences that they had as they became disciples. There were different callings, different means of being called to Christ. Some were called by a preacher, right? John the Baptist. Others were called by a family member, right? This is Simon Peter being called by Andrew. Others were called by a friend, Philip and Nathaniel. And for some, it was Christ directly calling them without the means of a human agent. That would translate to maybe some of us being called directly from reading the scriptures without a preacher. No matter how it happened, no matter how the different callings manifested, what's important to understand is that Christ is the one who is always working behind the scenes, and he is the one who is orchestrating it all. So no matter how we were called to faith in Christ, like these disciples, Christ is ultimately the one that was orchestrating the entire event that brought us to him. He is our good shepherd, and he pursues us. We see different experiences in these men coming to Christ. Some seem like they are the ones who seek after Jesus. 
Those are the first two disciples, including Andrew. They were pursuing Jesus, and Jesus said, come and see. Others were sought by Christ when they were not seeking him. You know what I mean by that. I'm meaning their experience. I'm not talking about in reality of what was actually happening. But in their experience of what took place, some seemed as though they were genuinely running after Christ, and others know that they were not even seeking him when the Lord kicked the door in on their life and owned them as his disciple. For some, the call to come to Christ was enough to make them feel secure just to rest in him as their savior. For others, they needed Christ to confirm how he sees them in order to give them that security. Now, no matter which one you might fit into, no matter which category of experience you have in becoming a disciple of Christ, what is important is to understand that Christ received every single one of these disciples, regardless of how different and, and, and various their experiences of becoming a disciple were. Then they had different responses to the gospel call. Some people responded to the message of Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by following him immediately out of curiosity. Some, have had, some had such an overwhelming experience with Christ at the beginning of salvation that there was no room for doubt, and they immediately began going out and evangelizing others. For others, they heard the message of the gospel and remained slightly skeptical. They had questions, and they needed to investigate it further. Well, no matter which response might be you, you need to recognize that each one of those responses is a fruit of genuine faith, and each one of them will be met by Christ in, in the person who comes to him. So no matter what category you may fall into, the invitation and the command of the gospel is the same. If you would be saved and if you would be able to say with confidence, we have found the Messiah, then you must act upon the invitation to come and see him. You must come to Christ. You must come to the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Messiah, the King of Israel, the Son of Man. You must come to Him and you must see Him for yourself if you are going to be a faithful disciple of the Lord. There are no second-hand disciples. I think it was Zach Johnson, last time I brought something like that up, he said, I was thinking, God has no grandchildren. Right? And that's true. God has no grandchildren. He only has children. There's no substitute for a living and vibrant and real and increasing personal experience of Jesus for yourself. That is the invitation of the Gospel of John. And I pray that as we move forward into that Gospel, we will each one of us take that to heart. Would you pray with me as we end? Our Lord God, we recognize our limitations, we recognize our failings, and we know that the only answer is Jesus. Jesus, it's your blood and your righteousness that are our beauty and glorious dress. And when we come to stand before you, Father, for judgment, we see you on your glorious throne. Pray that you would hide us in that rock of ages, Lord, and that we would know we're clothed in Christ's blood and righteousness, and that that would give us confidence to stand before you in that great day. Father, give us grace to come and to see Christ. Give us grace to continue to seek after you in our Lord Jesus. May you meet us by your Spirit and empower us, Lord, to obey your will, to live our lives in fellowship with him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the benediction from Jude 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.